Hey everybody, Jan Bernakovich here with All Points Design. That's allpointsdesign.ca and regenerativeliving.online. And I am ecstatic, really, to be talking with Natalie Topa. Uh, she's coming to us from Nairobi in Kenya. And I had the opportunity to be introduced to Natalie through a mutual friend of Zach Weiss. And when I started to look at Natalie's work, I was floored at the scope and the attention to detail that Natalie gives to her work in working with uh, communities at risk, working with communities at large all over the world, but now largely in East Africa for the last 17 years. And something that struck me about Natalie was that there is this there's this way, Natalie, that you you speak with you speak with a lot of colloquialisms and a lot of common speak to make it really easy to understand things. I know we're going to hear in the presentation today and the case study about prisons for water. We don't usually hear about prisons in the positive, but there's these prisons for water. There's these smile berms. There's 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 a realness to what you do, which I find super refreshing and fun to talk to, and just feels like talking with a friend that I've had for years and yet we've only had a few conversations and so i just want to say first and foremost everyone you're in for a huge treat it's going to be a long conversation so if you're one of those people that likes long format you're in for a treat i would grab a cup of tea grab a friend there's a case study here that takes a flood and turns it into food takes a mountain that has been so eroded to the point to where there's been loss of life but also it was so eroded that at certain parts of the year they had to bring in water trucks, even though this land was overflowing with water. And I think this is a great example of how if we don't manage a resource, it becomes pollution. And sometimes that pollution becomes deadly. And so this case study in Burundi is a wonderful way of starting to understand what low tech erosion controls can look like, what sinking and storing water can look like. And what doing it at a level of regeneration means. We always talk about degenerative, regenerative, and regenerative. Degenerative being less than we had before, generative being the same, regenerative being more. But I think in this, this example, there's, there's the end stage of regenerative where we're actually building capacity, where it's not just doing good, but it's making sure we become redundant as possible as practitioners and interventionist and really working alongside the people to build their capacity. And Natalie's going to tell a bit of the story about how they had to evacuate due to COVID and with videos and wonderful, simple drawings. I just love seeing all the drawings. She was able to continually coach the individuals there to do the work themselves, to build uh, their native understanding of these concepts and really sink it into the landscape. And so without further ado, Natalie Topa, thanks so much for joining me. And I'm just so pleased you've decided to say hello and welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Javin. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm here in Nairobi, Kenya. I've been living in East Africa for almost 17 years. And in just the 17 years that I've been here, I've actively, with my own eyes, seen landscapes eroding. Uh, and when ecologies collapse, they take with them livelihoods, food security, and sometimes peace and stability, right? So um, I've been working in the context of forced displacement for the whole time I've been here, uh, almost 17 years. And in a previous agency that I was working in, uh, when they started to see sort of the demonstrative projects that I was leading, they said, gee whiz, you know, can we give you $100,000 and just do whatever you want? And so we were trying to establish a presence uh, in Burundi to serve the displacement affected populations there. When I say displacement affected communities, I'm talking about mixed migration. That can be refugees, people who leave their country. It can be IDPs, internally displaced people who stay within their country but move to another town or location. Uh, it can be returnees, people who, uh, you know, maybe the smoke has cleared and they feel that it's safe to return to their homes and reestablish themselves, but that could be generations later. And then we have the host community and host community is a bit euphemistic because they're not walking around with trail, you know, trays of welcome drinks. Um, they are communities that are, are equally uh, resource stretched. You know, they are scarce of resources, whether it's water or food or services, and yet they're having to uh, 
um, cohabitate with, uh, with a population that they may or may not want there. And that population might be cutting down trees and accessing and using resources that the, that community that lives in scarcity already is, uh, you know, doesn't have enough for themselves to thrive. So um, we, everything we do has to be through a conflict sensitive lens. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Um, so I'm calling this uh, presentation Regenerative Design for Disaster Resilience and Food Security in Burundi, From Floods to Food. That's a term that I came up with, up with uh, to describe exactly what we're doing. We're taking this massive resource of, of extreme water events, pacifying them and getting those into productive systems to restore a community agro ecosystem. So my name is Natalie Topa. Um, I live here in East Africa for, for quite some time. And I'm going to walk us through how working hand in hand with the community using only locally available materials and concepts, no gimmicks, right? Knowledge is the main input. So I'm going to take you through this story. I'm calling it regenerative design for disaster resilience because we are trying to support the community in their capacity to regenerate and restore actively the and, and you know get that landscape into autopilot so that they can meet their needs for food, fodder, fiber, fuel, fertility, and pharmaceuticals with an F. So this um, this is part of sort of work that I've been leading um, in the region in East Africa, Africa, and the Middle East uh, for years at different scales. I use the term sponge because. Most people know what a sponge is. It's something that holds and absorbs water and nutrient and can store it for a long time without drying up. So, you know, if we're talking about a very small space food system, like around a refugee shelter or a home or a household, um, I talk about the sponge gardens, which can be used to cool and shade the house and make people resilient, you know, to extreme temperatures, uh, as well as events like flood and drought. Moving up to the higher level, sponge farms are just what they sound like, moving into the homestead scale, um, even around the office compounds of NGOs uh, and the farm level. So how do we design that, you know, how do we do citizen engineering to the whole farm to capture stormwater run on as well as hold the run off, right? So we normally talk about run off, but we also want that farm to grow arms <laughs> to reach out to nearby culverts or roads or footpaths and pull that water into the farm and then make sure that we, you know, um, we, we hold it in that system. And then of course, if many people start doing this around their homes and in their farms, we now move into sponge camps like uh, work I've been leading in Uganda, where many of the refugees from South Sudan are each applying these concepts around the home. And little by little, you know, there's a greenification and a, a resilience to flood and drought at the scale of a village. And then of course, the sponge watershed where if, you know, if households, farms, <laughs> villages and camps um, start to apply these concepts um, at scale. Now we start to get into the catchment level. Um, and it's really important right now, Javin, you know, we've, uh, my, my biological father's from Ukraine, my mother's from Poland. You might've heard there's some, you know, there's some problematic things going on in that region, but I've been worried about wheat wars for years. And, um, you know, half of the food that WFP uh, provides to refugees comes from Ukraine. So this is, you know, problematic. And what we, you know, this provides an opportunity, unfortunately, um, to sort of come home, <laughs> uh, focus at the bioregional level and localize, uh, you know, the, the things that we need. If you need it, grow it within the bioregion and respond to, you know, what your bioregion can provide and thrive with. Um, I'm going to talk about four main types of soil erosion. Um, these are scientific concepts and engineering concepts, but it's really about gravity. <laughs> We're just talking about basic gravity. So the types of soil erosion, you know, if you're looking out at a field, you know, the first type of erosion that maybe if trees have been cut down, maybe it's been overgrazed, the first stage of erosion is raindrops on top of soil because 
when you've removed that vegetative cover and that acts like a, a shock absorber, now those raindrops are like little jackhammers and they're breaking up the soil and getting it ready to wash away. So it creates a crust on the top of soil. And that's what people often don't understand is how does drought lead to flood? Well, when you create this crusting of soil, then the next rain event that comes, it means it's just, it's not gonna infiltrate and it just slides right off and creates extreme water events. So that aggregate starts to break down and turn into particles, which are then easily washed away by both wind and rain. Um, the second stage is what we called what we call sheet erosion. Organic matter and nutrients flow away since the top layer of the finest, uh, you know, the finest soil is gone. And we have loss of vegetation and overgrazing that will create bare areas. So those are the those are the indicators. When you start to see bare, you know, bare patches of dirt and exposure of roots, you know, you'll see uh, Javan river beds and stream beds where a, a root of a tree is just hanging out. Like tr trees don't grow roots into the air. That's not what they do, right? So clearly, that um, uh, what do we call it? That islandification. Um, you know, where we, where it'll become like a little island, ped, pedestal Pedestoling. of a, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, that's, uh, those are really clear indicators. Then of course you have a rill and a rill is when you start to get these little tiny wrinkles and cr crevices where, don't forget water like humans is really lazy. It will always take the, the slowest, I mean, sorry, the easiest uh, path Right. So once you start to get those little tiny wrinkles and crevices and creases in the soil, that's where water will drop into. And then you start to have concentrations that create erosion scars that we call rills. And then, of course, those rills, um, you know, we, you've seen and I know you and I have talked about this, Javin, you know, that triangle of soil erosion, which is like speed, volume and depth. I don't think it should be a triangle, but it works really well because like you can balance one or the other. Um, but there's a thing missing there, which is elevation. And when a rill, you know, let's say there's a little stone in a rill, when that water passes over the stone and, and gains energy intensity from the elevation drop, that energy starts to be like a tooth. And one thing that, that you say, uh, Javin that I love is that it starts to just that tooth starts to cut uphill and it's like it's unzipping the entire watershed so that water and nutrient just fly right out of the system. And of course gully erosion is is what the final stage and that is where huge ravines just start to split open <laughs> like Moses on the sea and just uh you know, all of that nutrient and water and resources are just flying. It's, it creates a like a bowling alley or a super highway right out of the system. So it, there's no even time for that water to hang out and moisturize and soak and saturate the landscape. So we'll see examples of these in the presentation. Oops. Oh, I think I missed the slide. So, um, so when I'm training communities and governments and farmers, I try to focus their energy on four main components that are sort of the elements of design and regenerative thinking when we're creating a disaster resilience. So obviously soil and geology, right? We're digging the soil uh, and organizing the soil and stoneworks and earthworks uh, in order to help plant the rain in degraded landscapes, right? We want to plant the rain before we plant the crops. That's the saying from, uh, from um, Zebaniah Piri, uh, who has been highly quoted by Brad Lancaster, that whole concept of planting the rain. We want to generate structures and give boost to living systems. So when we do our earthworks and organize the, the ge geological <laughs> landscape, we're able to now impact water and hydrology. So say, you know, water and hydrology, how do we save water in well-structured soils for drier times? This is what we call green water. You've heard of black water or gray water. Green water is that water that is stored deep into those interstitial little nooks and crannies uh, deep inside the soil. And it, it is, it's passive irrigation, right? We're, we're banking so much moisture that throughout the growing season, water and plants, uh, sorry, plants and trees and, and vegetables and crops have access to that, that leftover moisture. I focus on spaces a lot because I'm talking about built environment shelters, refugee camps. I do work very much in forced displacement and you'll find a, a Somali woman 
uh, with, you know, maybe seven kids and she has a tiny little iron sheet structure and it's miserable. She lives in miserable conditions. So how do we, how do we harvest the water off of her rooftop, get it into a tree system so she has shade as well as food, maybe fodder. And even in a tiny little space, let's apply that design thinking to engineer the most optimal um, living environment, right? That's, that's productive and pleasant. Um, Cause we're talking in some cases of very, very hot temperatures where people live. And yeah, so then of course you have the plants and biology. I see a lot of people get really excited about the engineering aspects and, you know, either with a spade or earth moving equipment, doing all the digging, but you can't do earthworks without your planting works. And you must immediately be tossing your seed, broadcasting or planting your trees, because you've got to get those root systems in place immediately to stitch together and tie together that soil and that landscape. So don't forget the biology. It's a it's something that I've seen many systems either fail or break because, right? And this also creates an opportunity for species recovery, agrobiodiversity, indigenous food systems. Let's bring back those ancient seeds, right? Those forgotten foods, those sacred grains, and increase the agrobiodiversity of the agroecosystem. Um, so, you know, we. Uh, I recently made an, uh, produced an animated film, uh, and these are our images from that film, to help describe to communities here the concepts which is not innate, innate knowledge, right? Tree, you know, basically to really break it down, we live on a forest planet and we are forest people. And I don't say that in some, <laughs> some uh, you know, funny way, um, but it's true. I mean, our system is designed that way. Nutrient organic material goes back into the system. It feeds itself. We are able to harvest that. And so the, the trees in a system, once they are gone, you know, the, the leaves fall and feed. The, let me put it this way. The long con that I deal with is that chemistry, soil chemistry is something you have to purchase. The long con is that they don't tell us that the soil chemistry comes from the soil biology, right? So the more organic material, the more those organisms are able to break that down into the chemistry that plants need. So the importance of trees cannot be underestimated for their, uh, their fungal relationships, the bacterial relationships that create the well-structured soils that protect us from disaster. When those trees started to get cut down, this is something we see so much in East Africa, um, our bags of charcoal on the side of the road. You know, um, people are denuding landscapes for livelihoods. It is, the, it is the most severe form of poverty and the lowest indicator when you see a woman carrying sticks on her head. Like that is the lowest potential economic activity that you can see a human being go through. That is a massive indicator of major desperation. People have to go out and exploit bush products in order to survive. So this is not a blame game, right? This is, and by the way, the whole entire US <laughs> hundreds of years ago uh, looked very, very different. Um, and we've denuded the entirety of that. So trees are gone, wind gusts increase, they swirl away with all of those nutrients that are left behind. Um, and so this is a situation that we see all the time is that those, those erosion patterns that I talked about turn into soil conditions that just are you know, braiding gullies and all the things that you need to grow food are leaving the system. So ecological infrastructure is destroyed and it literally creates a domino effect of disasters. Food insecurity, water insecurity, animals are dying, livelihoods are not viable, people enter into conflict, we have mixed migration and forced migration, and this is solvable. I want this presentation to feel like a good news situation. Um, we can, we can at, a, at a little by little, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sell snake oil or whatever. Little by little, we can start to repair and heal those systems with local, no gimmicks, okay? I'm not a gimmicks kind of person. So again, the main ingredients, soil, water, and plants, the geology, hydrology, and biology. So I'm gonna take us through how we worked with this community in Burundi in a, in a province called um, Giharo. And the, the name of the hill, we, there was one hill in particular that we were requested to come and address. Uh, it's called Kabingo, which, what a great name. So this is Kabingo Hill. <laughs> and, you know, when we, when we got there, um, it was just so clear that you can't, 
not address the entirety of the system, right? The whole mountain is a living system. The trees, the soil, the hydrological behavior, the extreme water events, the people living on it, the animals. So this is an entire interconnected, interrelated, interdependent system in its vitality and in its destruction, right? It'll thrive as a system and biological uplift happens as a system, but the destruction and the deterioration is also systemic. We went through many different types of interventions from focusing on individual trees to individual farms. And what I wanna stress in this presentation is that it is, um, we're not going into strong arm nature with giant concrete structures and dams and brah, you know, <laughs> what I would call more of a masculine approach. It's more of having many different types of small, many, many, many different types of small interventions across the entire landscape. And on that note, when you think about climate change, it wasn't just one thing. You see all these like debates, so is agriculture, is it fossil, you know, is it energy? Climate change is a result of many, 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 many people doing many, 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 many small things. And the solution is the same, right? The reversal of that is many, many people doing many, many small things. So that's what the story is about. Before we launch, any thoughts or comments, Javin? You know, I think what, what hits me already is that when we talk about some of these interventions, we're always thinking it's got to be big, it's got to be bold, but it really starts with the basics. In permaculture, we talk about patterns to details. And yeah. you've taken this pattern of not only erosion, but also uh, individuals that are displaced either externally or internally to themselves and their communities and said, mm -hmm. what, are, what is the smallest granular elements that they need to understand and learn and then slowly started to build that competency so that as they were working on the landscape which we're about to get into they built that incrementally and i think that's really important for people to take away from the beginning here is that the this is not far flung people could literally learn this from this presentation if not the potential upcoming workshops and and education you'll be offering it's just, it's so matter of fact. And I think we forget that. Yeah, knowledge is the main input. You know, I'm, I'm not into gimmicks and high tech innovation. This is ancient innovation. It's understanding basic principles of gravity. And I feel like, you know, when we talk about low tech erosion or permaculture, you know, permaculture and low tech erosion control has done for science what Jesus did for God, <laughs> or whoever, is democratizing it, making it accessible, right? Everyone can become a scientist. You don't need to be literate. You don't need to have a, a degree in engineering, right? You can own this. You got, you know, you got this. <laughs> um, and that's what we are trying to tell people who may not be literate, who may have no education, who are totally vulnerable, that they can, using concepts of design, and you know, sharpening their lenses for design can reduce the disasters and increase abundance. So, okay, so <laughs> this is the beginning part of our story. Uh, all I knew before is that there was a mountain, okay? There was a mountain, it was in Burundi, and it was problematic because it had major erosion, flash floods, and five people had died on this mountain. So when we started to learn more about this mountain, we found that it had a big, long, footpath that went all the way up the mountain from the bottom to the top. And the thing that we have to understand about uh, footpaths, um, you know, pathways, even dirt roads is that through that compaction, we start to create a hardscape that is not pervious and does not absorb water. So water stays on the top and slides right off and accumulates and grows into flood and, or, and you know, into extreme water events that become very incisive and energetic with that destructive energy. So there was a footpath going all the way up at the top of the mountain. And then as we started to understand more about how that was affecting the water behavior, um, there were many, well, not be, we had a lot of different issues uh, you know, on the on the mountain. Let me just see what I had written as a caption. Oh yes, with the original tree plant and root systems gone, this is a, a, a mountain totally and utterly denuded. The original root systems, right, and the leaves of the trees that fall and create that chemistry have been replaced by eucalyptus. 
So the original soil chemistry has been disrupted. You can't just plant any tree in its place. You know, if you have some ancient acacias or whatever, and just raise those and bring in um, eucalyptus, grevillea, and pine, which is what Burundi has. Why? Because the government owns the tea industry. They need fast growing eucalyptus trees in order to harvest them and use them to burn for dehydration of the tea leaves in order to do the commercial sales. So uh, the government incentivizes afforestation using eucalyptus. And again, it's a totally assassinating the soil chemistry because it's a different new biology, different chemistry. So the structure is not the same that it was historically. So with the original tree plant and root systems gone, water is just melting the mountain and taking all the soil and nutrients with it. Water behavior is more extreme with each season as it's incising these deeper and deeper, um, you know, gullies and ravines that create flash floods. And as I mentioned, as we were preparing uh, today for the presentation, Javin, this mountain is a, is a giant mound of sand. Like there's no bedrock. I don't even understand geologically how this thing came to be. Um, and it is just a mountain of sand. Like imagine you're at the beach and you make a big mound and it had a lot of trees all over it, which were creating a soil structure and holding it all together. But those trees are gone. And now the water behavior is just carving that mountain up. So, um, this is, I'm going to tell the story sort of as we're coming into the community uh, heading up to the mountain, right? So as you're driving through already through the alluvium, you see this braiding, this erosive braiding that these are going to become deep gullies. And these are poor communities. They can't afford grading and a sub base and everything, you know, every single year, but these are economic corridors, right? This is how trade and commerce and people and cargo are move throughout the region. And so once this infrastructure is compromised, it has a multiplier effect of, of, uh, uh, vulnerability economically and otherwise for the community. Um, so here we are, I was actually that, <laughs> If you see that white guy, where's Waldo? And um, that's Daniel Lawton, um, who came at one point also to help us with some uh, of the interventions, but we literally had to stop. And what the community is looking at is where the road has literally washed away and there's a massive temporary river of water, which is supposed to have stayed on the mountain, right? Historically, it was, should have just stayed where it was. Water is not supposed to move, Javin historically, you know, forests that are a, a full thriving intact forest that has a big spongy forest floor, when a big rainfall comes up to 90% of that water stays in the forest. Remove the forest, this is what happens. So it's basic gravity. So now we enter, we're walking up, we start to walk up the bottom of the mountain and you can see how the water behavior has become very straightened, right? The, the, the fluvial geomorphology is rectifying. And now these are just giant bowling alleys <laughs> with, and super highways with water and nutrient just leaving or um, depositing. So that's a whole other issue, right? So what you have croplands, people planting their crops and you have this sediment piling on top of it. So you can see they're trying to mitigate it here. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, they're trying to create little you know, little tiny walls and little kind of dikes to protect the water from going into the fields. So this is what it looks like as we're moving up. On the lower left-hand corner also, I wanted to just point out that uh, engineers, locally hired engineers by the local government came and did what's called in Swahili, which means dig up, dig down, and um, or dig down, dig up. It's like the name of a swale, but it's not on contour. If you make a bioswale that is not on contour, you are conceiving a new erosion pattern because that water is gonna to slide to one end. So um, as we're moving up the, up, the, um, up the footpath, you know, I'm explaining to the team, even where that water, you can see a manual on the left-hand side is pointing to the exact point where there is a teeny tiny little drop you know, we talk about the triangle of uh, erosion again with speed, volume, and depth, but the minute water is given the opportunity to fall by a centimeter, it gains energy in that within that period that it's falling. And that energy behaves like the tooth that creates the head cuts, right? So you can already see how this is what we would call a rill. 
and how that is, even though it doesn't look like that any extreme water event is happening here, the concentration where that's moving into an incisive pattern is going to become the gully that you see on the right. And this again is where, this was the original footpath. So the original, this is the before, basically treat this as a before and after, right? So here on the left is the footpath. You see that gully starting to form. And then on the right hand side is where it has totally opened up. And the issue here is that people, they can't walk in the gully. So they just scoot a little over to the left. They keep scooting. And then that, that soil keeps falling and, you know, getting washed away. And then they scoot more to the side. And now they're, you know, they're scooting, 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 and the footpath is increasingly going into the neighbor's farm. And that is another source of conflict, right? Because look at on the right hand side uh, of that, that's a, that's a farmer growing beans and g-nuts. G-nuts are peanuts. Um, they call them ground nuts. So you can see these two erosion patterns where um, uh, Gilbert, Jobert, our staff is standing, those are going to break off and be become a part of the gully. And that all those people who are standing there are going to have to scoot over to the right into that field of groundnuts. <laughs> like, how, why, how would that not cause conflict, right? So it's, a, it's so systemic, it's complex, and it's, inter it's really interrelated. So here again, just extreme erosion. And you can see, it's very clear that it's the footpath where all that hardscape has collected the water. So here it is again. And don't forget, as I mentioned, five little boys uh, have died in these gullies because they're out herding their animals, their, their shoats, if you know that term, shoats or sheeps and goats. Um, and they fall and drop, in, that's actually an industry term. <laughs> um, they fall into these deep gullies and have perished. It's really very, very sad. This is why we were invited specifically to come to this community. But if you see bedrock, I mean, where, there's no bedrock. It's endless sand. It just keeps digging down and down. So as we're coming up um, the mountain towards the top, this little house right here is the house of a woman named Evelina. Evelina is the topmost farmer in the system. So what that means is that all above her house, it's stony, uh, non-cultivated land. She's the topmost farmer. Uh, Evelina is... Um, she is, you know, she's part of the host community, but her husband is a refugee in Tanzania. She's very vulnerable. She has some mental um, situation. And also she has, doesn't have strong health. Uh, she's acutely vulnerable, but, what, but she, at being the topmost farmer, we knew it was very important that we use that as the first opportunity to get major amounts of water off of the footpath that passes next to her house and into some type of system that we're gonna design. Um, okay. So I just, I had to include this photo um, as a joke, you know, wait, is, is this the real cause of erosion on the mountain? So this little boy was following us everywhere we went and you can see his little homemade, uh, I don't know if it's a scooter or a Harley or what, but, um, but he just rides that thing up and down the mountain and uh, he may not cause the erosion, but he is a user of the site and he is actually contributing like all the other people on that footpath to the erosion of the site. Um, so, oops. so what we did, so this is now looking uphill from Evelina's uh, area. You can see immediately how rocky and stony the landscape is. So this is, this is right above her farm where people cannot cultivate. It's just way too rocky. So what we did is we start, you know, this was my first time on the mountain. And the important thing was to get a, a select few community members to start to introduce the concepts of design, the principles of water harvesting, of soil building, of uh, soil conservation. And so we did that through Evelina's perma garden. She also had water entering from the footpath into her compound and it was causing major erosion. So we wanted to capture that water and get it into production. So what that looks like is by providing only the basic local tools and knowledge as the main inputs. Again, no gimmicks, only gravity, biology, and citizen engineering. We have locally available tools. We show people how to make basic survey tools so that we can measure and identify the natural contours and patterns of the land. It's what I call window shopping, you know, for pattern. Uh, we just, we take a look at, at the pattern and then we can decide, okay, what do we, what can we do with this pattern? So, um, oh wait, Gavin, you showed me how to do this annotate, one second. 
draw blue. Okay, so, you know, this is the footpath. Can you see, Jamin? This, this is the footpath that passes her house. And what happens is water was coming down here into her compound. And you can kind of see this erosion pattern. And it was heading into her farm and causing erosion there. So what we did is, oh, how do I undo that? <laughs> if I want to oh, erase. Uh, well, we don't need to erase. So what we did is we took that water, if you look in the lower left hand, and we want this water to fill up this bioswale on contour. And when it fills up, we made like a little rolling dip here. So when it fills up too much, then this becomes the spillway and it heads away from her house. So again, it just comes down here and away from the house, whereas originally it was entering and going in there. Yeah, using only locally available materials, we show people how to create that sponge that feeds the soil organisms. Uh, you know, that creates the nutrients in, in the food <laughs> um, and builds uh, that sponge that retains the moisture and extends the growing season, right? So basically what we're doing is we're creating these long, um, well, you know, deep dug beds that are filled with all of these spongy organic materials. And it becomes like a water storage tank with a garden on top. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have the bioswale above, um, just behind where these guys are standing, that's gonna harvest water coming off of this, um, this little slope here, uh, soak that into the bioswale. And then, you know, water will continue to go downhill. We just want that to happen under the soil, right? Not on top of the soil. So that water will under the soil now move towards the garden bed. The bed itself is on contour, will harvest water and will retain that water into the growing, uh, into the dry season. The more we perennialize, uh, and stabilize these systems with perennial plants, then the more we have microclimate shade and year round food security. It's very viable. It's way more simple than people might think. So here you can see on the left, you've got the bioswale. We cover that with the trellis. <laughs> Jav and I talk about three thieves of water, right? The three thieves of water are sun, wind, and slope. What I tell farmers is that if you can see the soil, the sun can see the soil and the sun's eyes are sucking the moisture right out of the soil. So we want to protect from those three thieves. All of our design is about protecting from those thieves of water. So here we've got, you know, uh, the bioswale on contour, these double dug beds. And we even, um, with the A-frame, make sure that the top of the garden bed is completely level so that we don't create any, you know, erosive corners or anything like that. And this was Evelina's permagarden when we finished with it. Um, so you can see we've mulched it, we've fenced it, we planted it. Um, she had some decomposing material um, that looks acutely black here. Um, but anyway, uh, those are the beds. And the thing with Evelina is, as I mentioned, she's quite vulnerable and she uh, was actually hospitalized. She was very ill for some weeks. I don't have the after pictures. I'd love to show you before and after. It started to grow, there was food growing, the trellis was becoming covered, um, but she also has very vulnerable neighbors um, and they came in and took what was available and actually destroyed the garden. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, I mean, can you blame them? I mean, ugh, you know, this is why it's important to have perennial systems, right? Uh, because if they had come in and harvested something that uh, was perennial, then, it could at least remain. It's a permanent thing that could continue to grow when she comes back, at least could maybe thrive again. But anyway, it's really important when we're talking about doing community-based approaches, this, these are the realities, right? We do have a lot of these um, sort of nuances that we have to factor in. Um, so, okay, the first, uh, in the first phase of this is when I went in and uh, was doing the training of the perma garden, just so that people started to get an understanding of like, okay, water harvesting, wow, we never knew, uh, deep soil preparation, all these concepts. But now it's time to kind of come together as a larger community uh, with some people who already now have a bit of understanding of where we're going with this whole thing and have an entire community engagement process. So the first step of that was, I'm not an expert on that mountain. I don't know what, <laughs> what their reality is. They're the consultants of their reality, right? Um, they're the experts. They have that experiential capital. So uh, what we did is break um, com the community into teams. And again, we are, are here with uh, IDPs, returnees, and host community 
really like one third of each um, working together. So there's also sort of a peace building, you know, co community cohesion element as people are trying to solve problems collectively. And we asked them to just give us a snapshot of what is happening in the community. And you can see these women here are pointing. They're, they are very clear, you know, it's not to scale, but this drawing that they have is, um, it shows the whole story. It shows the water behavior. It shows that, you see that deep red looking, highway um, in the center, that's the major gully and the footpath that we're talking about. So, you know, we, we started to have a common understanding, a common uh, language around what the problems are, and then we could get to work on some of the solutions. So we marched back up the mountain, and we now, fr from the concepts of Regina's Perna Garden, are now doing, uh, sorry, not Regina, Evelina, taking Evelina's land and turning that into a sponge farm. So here, and again, this is not to scale, um, <laughs> Uh, I'm an urban planner, that's an urban planning joke. Um, so, you know, that we're taking that water as soon as we can, the first opportunities before it starts pummeling down the hill to turn that into this interconnected fill and spill circuit of her farm and that is a sponge farm. So, you know, water comes off of the, off of the, um, of the trail into the first soil, it spills into this little obstacle forest, do, 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 and then you know into another soil, and then down to these what we call smile berms or water harvesting structures for trees. You can call them media lunas, met and pan. But what I wanted to show is that um, her house would be somewhere you know just around here. We couldn't allow that water to. It's a huge amount of water, huge. Uh, to come to her house. So what we did is with that net and pan, we did like four, three, two, one, and spilling, 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 always on this side in the direction of the path. So that what we're doing is we're just sort of borrowing water from its original path and trajectory, banking it, and whatever is the balance remaining, it just continues on its original pathway, okay? So this is Evelina's path water harvesting sponge farm. If it what happens is that that water, this is now where it enters into a gully off of the footpath. And you can see here, the team is looking at that. And so we're trying to figure out how do we stop this water from entering into this gully? And again, Javin, you can see these two erosion scars. Those are gonna become, those are gonna break off. You can see that that's unzipping up the hill. So the, the same team that had done the sponge, uh, the perma garden, now we're up uh, above her house and we're gonna do an entire farm design. I love this photo on the left, Javin, because you can see one, two, three women engineering with this A-frame and then there's this man holding a baby, um, which is just a reversal of what we see so often. So I just, I was so happy to have captured that. Um, we had a big mix, about half and half men and women. Mm. So we are showing them how we, you know, do the, uh, how we use the A-frame. And here we've taken this entire bioswale that was on contour and dug that into a swale. And then here again, it's such a beautiful landscape. And you can see it's so green and it looks like it should be healthy and thriving. But if you don't address these patterns, this is a desert to be. I'm not joking. It's, you know, you can see, can you see all the smokestacks? Not as many, but there's smokestacks in the land off in the distance. That's charcoal. Those are trees becoming <laughs> desert. So um, anyway, here we are with the team and you can see the footpath that goes all the way down the mountain. So here, what we did is we just started to ask that water to take a turn. The thing I want also to mention here is you can't ask water to take a sharp turn because water, when it slows down, loses its speed and all of that turbidity, all of that suspended matter drops out. It bottoms out and it starts to silt up. So this one on the right, I would have actually made it more, I'm scared to do the annotation now. <laughs> Let's see if we can come back from this. So, you know, what I would have done here is actually gone a bit more diagonal so that the water could have like a more gentle flow. Whereas here, it's kind of like, it's it has too much of a right angle, okay? And that creates more slowing of the water. So you want a gentle um, turn so that you're not getting that bottoming out. But uh, but what we did do is create a big silt trap, a big, you know, long silt trap on every one of these. You can see here, there's a silt trap here. There's three swales. So that water is coming off of the footpath into here. Anything that has collected here is coming into here, and then also in this little interval into there. Does that make sense? 
Okay, clear all drawings. Now mouse, close, ah, pro. Okay, so um, this is kind of a before and after, but again, you know, Evelina didn't necessarily have the capacity to continue to maintain the site and the system, but you can see here, this is the before, and now there's this fenced farm. She's got the bioswales. These baskets are bamboo baskets that are tree protectors. So every single one of these baskets contains a tiny, tiny little baby tree. Mangoes, avocados, indigenous species, you name it, tons of trees. Here's just another view um, of what that looks like. So those are, you know, fencing and trellis are for verticality. Farms are, should not, like, I ask people if it's Jana or the Garden of Eden, whatever your thing is, did that look like a field of maize, you know, and you harvest it and for six months of the year, the Garden of Eden is just like a brown field of dirt? I don't think so. They had biodiversity. We don't know exactly what they had. We know they had apples. <laughs> um, but, you know, like if you look at the Quran, if you look at the Bible, that region, I always encourage our teams to grow Quranic species, not only the indigenous ones, but those ancient things we knew were growing there for long. So we try, you know, we make a long list of the indigenous biodiversity and try to make a plan for species recovery because that is the most appropriate response to create the soil chemistry that had the original structure of the soil. Um, so here's just more, you know, we tried to rectify that very straight line with rolling dips. Uh, we're creating here the smile berms, the, the media lunas. Um, so, and again, this is, this is coming from up the hill, so you can just see from the other angle how we're trying to bring that water in. This is the, a swale on the farm. It has big spillways that go, that we created later, that go into these giant smile berms or media lunas for the trees. So you can see, you know, this will spill into these trees, this will spill into these trees, and then there's another swale down below. And then, of course, the, the verticality for not only increased growing surface, but also for shading and protecting from the three thieves of water. So Javin, take a look at how big and deep these smile berms are. I, we call them smile berms because that sounds happy. It's a, like a smile shape. Um, uh, but they're really giant and deep because it's a huge amount of water coming off that mountain. And this is the first chance we've got to like, swallow it. So we're creating throats in the landscape to just swallow and swallow all this water. Um, and they're sizable, but this is what creates a reservoir and then we pack those full of mulch. So each tree will have that residual moisture to feed from throughout the year. And by the way, we have massively um, more, you know, success rates in growing trees than a lot of the tree planting programs. How did humans just not figure out how to grow trees? Like you see, they just dig a hole, stick a, <laughs> a, a seedling in there and then say a little prayer and leave. No, we're trying to establish an enabling environment so that this is so that the system can be regenerating itself as early on as possible. So, um, you know, again, going to planting the rain from floods to food. So here's just a little bit of a conceptual, you know, schematic of what that looks like, uh, what we would want that to look like. That's Evelina's farm, and all of this goes. You know, I'm trying to promote this concept of sponge farms. Looking, this is something that we were um, to do in Uganda, but it's universal design that I've made. So getting that water off of the road where it's protecting infrastructure, right? Because these roads have to be graded all the time or they become, you know, just uh, pits of mud that are not passable and market access is cut off during the rainy season. So we want to get that water off. It can be with machines. It can be with um, hand, hand dug, you know, labor-based earthworks. Get that water in, you know, if, if you have a chance to make a dam, if you have a impervious soil, um, like clay, um, but the point is it's a fill and spill circuit, right? It's water fills up, spills to the next system, fills up, and in the meantime, it's just deeply hydrating uh, all of that water and turning water from floods to food or from destruction to production or from fragile to fertile. <laughs> um, so any, I'm gonna pause there for a sec, Javin, any thoughts on that chapter or feedback yeah, or I, comments? I, I, I think uh, as I'm looking at this more and more, it's the simplicity of the process where there's an understanding of prime concepts or, or first concepts, and then a building upon those concepts, but always landed with integrating with people. It's always about what's the need of the people? What are they looking for with Evelina? It's you already have a person at risk and a place at risk. And so how do you secure her in such a way? So 
she then has bounty to pass on to others. And then the second thing that I really take in, and I love this about your work is there, there's a, uh, and in a good way, you know, I think when we say commodification, it's uh, it can be taken wrong, but in a good way, there's a commodification of these elements to make them owned by the people in their cultural currency. I always talk about this, especially when working with cities, if you don't speak city and ease, like if you can't speak that <laughs> language, then the city doesn't want to talk to you. And you speak the language of a common tongue where there's smile berms and there's, you know, farms to fertility. And, you know, there's, there's all of these brilliant little sayings that bring, they it brings it really to the core of it. Cause it is a simple process. Right. And I think that's what you, you do so expertly is bring it very simply to individuals. So that way they can get it right off the bat. It's what I call mental Velcro, right? Like you just, it just you want it to stick and so um okay so thanks for that um so beyond evelina's farm let's go back to the top of the system as i was saying um you know bald men are hot bald mountains are not so when you get out of the shower javin do you start drying your body from your head or from the feet <laughs> Right, I mean, you start at the head, right? From the head down. So, um, so the same thing with this mountain. So what we do, what we did is we went to the top of the mountain and we saw trees that were growing. We took our A-frame and made little smile berms, which is a, a contour-based design, right? You first find the contour and that is what dictates where the open side of your smile berm is. Um, and then what we do, um, what we call FMNR or Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration, simply put, it's a haircut. I just tell them, give all the trees a haircut uh, and take you know, those lower branches on the understory uh, of the tree. And we wanna chop and drop. So we've got, you see the green arrow, that green leafy matter and nitrogenous matter, as well as the brown branches that go now into the smile berm. What happens is that creates a biological uplift of the tree, a little growth spurt, and it starts to create a, that, that, um, that higher canopy that we're looking for to create dappled shade for, you know, to, to reduce, that impact of the erosion from raindrops that we talked about in the first slides. But even around the individual little crops they had, like there was, uh, it was communal land, but people were growing cassava. Cassava is manioc. It's a, what do you call it? Um, it's a tuber that is, that tapioca comes from. Uh, not agave. In the U.S., it's, anyway, yeah. So it's cassava. It's a it's a big rhizome root, starchy root, and so even little, making little tiny micro earthworks around those to help feed the, you know, the plant. But every opportunity we get, we want to park that water. We want parking lots of water, not super highways, right? So parking lot, parking lot, parking lot, parking lot. Um, and what that looks like in real time, or real imagery is. Uh, you know, retrofitting these individual existing trees. So not only the trees that we're planting anew, but even the existing trees, we create a smile berm. And you don't have to dig this. Even if you just take stones or the, um, what do you, I can't remember what you call that, like where you do the straw mulches, you know, uh, oh, yeah. you know some yeah. sticks. Yeah. yeah, fish yeah. scale straw, vertical mulching. Yeah, vertical mulching, exactly. So, um, and then here we're chopping and dropping. We're just trying to give the landscape a haircut and drop all that organic material on the ground. So moving down, the, here's the, around the little tiny cassavas, you know, more around the trees. So these are these are not on people's property. So again, in this in this particular project, we're dealing with individual homes and the sponge shelter, the sponge farm, but then this is what I call the landscape level, the community level. This land is not owned by anyone, but if you see a tree or something trying to be a tree, you know, just help it out. Um, then also at the very, very top, we tried to do small scale path water harvesting in the unfarmed fields to get as much water into the soil as possible before it starts pummeling downhill, gaining energy and speed. So, you know, these are teeny tiny little footpaths that we are seeing, but the second you start to see something that's a, a, a real, like, just give that, you know, create the situation where that's going to turn into the field rather than continuing on the footpath where it's going to just gain more energy and destructive stuff. Then we had check dams on the footpaths. 
every one meter. We have so many stones that why not? But, and we have so much water, why not, right? We need to do whatever we can to try to get this slowed down. So every one meter, stone, 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 stones. And of course you're trying to, as we're going downhill, you want the small stones first and then go bigger. But then it's also important to do some kind of skirting, right? At the bottom as well, so that you're preventing that erosive energy on the fall on the other side of the rocks, the downhill side. Um, so again, you know, as we're and the and the stones kept changing, like on the top they're white, then they were sort of mixed, and you know, so it was just such an interesting uh, landscape. The stone check dams every one meter all the way until we reach Evelina's site, and then we run out of stones. Here we are doing one rock dams, ORDs or poor man's swale, although that maybe sounds discriminatory or, uh, <laughs> but anyway, the point is, is that using our A-frame, we're just continuing to, you know, do window shopping for patterns throughout the landscape. And then we start to think, okay, we are seeing rills and we're seeing, you know, uh, visible um, uh, evidence of erosion. So wherever we are seeing that, we want to sheet flow everything out. So we want, you know, what is the opposite of slow spread and sink? It's fast, incisive, and superficial. <laughs> so we're just trying to reverse that here. It's fast, superficial, and incisive. We want to slow it down, spread it out, and sink it into the soil. So here, what that looks like is, you know, you can see here we've got all kinds of different stones. Everything is on contour. These one rock dams. They're a bit hidden in the grass, but you can see also in combination with uh, with tree systems and water harvesting structures for individual trees that are mulched and protected. So really looking at the entire landscape, not even on individual people's farms. And I thought I should show some people. <laughs> so here we've got the team. This is the community members. Um, you know, we try to have fun. I bring speakers. Uh, they did away with MP3 players. I had an iPod and now I'm just, I don't know what to do. Um, but I used to have my iPod with my speakers and we, you know, as we're like carrying rocks and it's, it's usually a lot of fun. We try to make it a really good time, a positive, uh, you, you know, just community party. A big restorative party. So the other intervention that we did was pacifying water through gully plugging or making leaky weirs. Is leaky weirs an Australian term? Maybe. Anyway, we want to pull that destructive energy out, plugging up the ravines with leaky weirs using only locally available materials. So here we are trying to, you know, carve them out a bit uh, open so uh, the water has a chance to spread out more rather than being very, very channelized. We actually, can you see the goats there, Javin? Okay, if we had cows, we'd use cows. <laughs> if we had gerbils, we'd use gerbils. What we had were goats. So we pegged them um, into the gully. We every goat is tied, um, and we just wanted their tiny little hooves to, you know, just they're not very compactive. It's it was it's a bit of a no novelty, but you get the point. Uh, they weren't hugely effective, but the, if you had cows in there or larger um, ruminants then you know there you can keep them in there for a while to start to press down and compact uh, and flatten out because what they do is they sort of carve off the soil on the edge and compact it down into the into the bed of the ravine and within one rain i mean i was on the top of the mountain it started raining and i was by myself having like a spiritual moment um, and then as i'm coming down i could see that immediately it was taking effect. Every single check dam was already having sedimentation, you know, evidence of, of this collection of sediment and nutrient behind it. And then of course, here you can see already a check dam. The point is to create this pooling to establish that just momentary extended moisturization of the surrounding landscape. And then eventually that will silt up and tear us off into a stepping. But then, as I told you um, earlier, I was on top of this mountain conducting this training. Daniel Lawton had to leave back to Australia days before. And I was basically told I have to go right now. And I was on the last plane out of Burundi before they locked down their airspace. They closed the airspace. 
Um, and so I had just, you know, we had through the training imparted all these skills and concepts to the team. And now I had to depend on my iPhone and my finger art to try to guide them and do remote coaching, remote mentoring, sending them voice notes and videos and lots of drawings and using all the things accessible to me uh, to, con to help to continue to support them remotely. Uh, and this is just an example of how I, um, you know, how I do that. So here, uh, throughout the whole mountain, whether it's very narrow, deep ravines, or the, or as we go down towards the bottom of the mountain, they widen out. Um, but we're trapping that nutrient. And look, we're only using locally available materials. In some cases, these are banana stalks. Banana stalks are not a permanent thing. It's a vegetable. <laughs> it's going to rot. But in the meantime, it is, uh, it is, you know, um, activating the siltation. All of those good juicy things like dead lizard tails and, and bird poop and it, dead insects and all those people get trapped and it all breaks down and creates the enabling environment, those fertile conditions for the recruitment of vegetation. And it just activates this whole systemic um, uplift. Uh, so here we are again, and they, they do uh, increase the weaving you know, with more and more sticks, but these are all locally available free. I mean, we did bring in some materials, but this is nothing that the community can't do on their own, right? Uh, and they have been, they're repairing it, the, the local government's involved. So um, we also did plant a number of things like vetiver, bananas, uh, lemongrass, food, fodder, fiber, fuel, many different types of, 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 of vegetation. Um, so here we are again, here's another gully. So all kinds of different scales. It was a huge learning for all of us, you know, uh, every time the ravine takes a corner. So here's after the next rainy season, already you're starting to see it's filling in with all this vegetation, it's silting up. You see the sort of terracing effect. And then of course, uh, Tithonia is something that we were harvesting on the, we had to drive every day, two and a half hours to get to the village. You're not, we weren't allowed to sleep. Nobody, no foreigners are allowed to sleep in the village. It's a very politically sensitive, you know, post-conflict zone in advance of elections. So we harvested all this Tithonia that we planted also in the ravines with cassava, with so many other things. So now it's also a, a, a source for food. Right. Not only is it um, is the flooding being slowed down, but it's also <laughs> like it's becoming a little jungle of all kinds of good green things that you can go and harvest. This one I love because you can see here the the gully plug or the leaky weir, which was able to create such a cessation of this of this intensive energy that we now have a situation of land reclamation. People are once again now farming where they couldn't before due to these extreme events. And that is a really BFD, big darn deal, because you know this is now, we have more space for farming, uh, people are coming back into those, into those zones. But if you'll notice, they're still doing the same practices that caused the problem in the first place, right? You can still see their tilling, it's monoculture, um, and so it, there is a need for regular, you know, sensitization and working together side by side to just keep, you know, keep the system improving and, and avoiding those um, kind of harmful practices. So just really, oh, I'm going to pause there. Any thoughts or anything before the next chapter? No, no, I, I, I'm just, I'm struck by the abundance. I'm just struck by what's possible when you finally take that water you put it into productive use and yeah. you get folks to understand the process like it's just it's so readily available these solutions are readily available these these are not high tech this is not a, a massive amount of money that's invested this is very easily demonstrated and i think that's why these types of solutions have become so popular i don't know about you but working with some of the larger NGOs and some of the, the UN installations and things of that nature, it can be so much bigger and more potentially cumbersome than it needs to be. And yet this shows just how simple it, it can be and how effective with simple solutions this can be created. Yeah, so don't forget, I was given 100,000 USD to do this, but we were also setting up new offices, hiring management. So. I would say two thirds or even half 
you know, with 50,000 to $75,000 is really what it took to get where we are with this. And, um, you know, this is a house, this woman is called Mediatrice. And, you know, again, just those principles of that intensive planting, harvesting of water, building the soil, exactly what you're talking about. These are simple things, right? I mean, it's, um, you know, but once people start to understand, wow, we, once we just have this diversity and this microclimate, we can be protected from flood and drought and food insecurity. And I, again, want to, um, you know, reiterate that they reported 100% food increase. This is during lockdown. Right when fertilizers and seeds are not coming in. By the way, I never, ever, 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 ever would allow GMO or improved hybrid seeds that cannot be reproduced again and again and again. So we only brought in indigenous and open pollinated varieties so that people have also seed security. We're moving them away from from seed slavery. We want food. You know, food sovereignty begins with seed sovereignty. So they should be able to harvest and keep those seeds the way that their grandmothers did for thousands of years. Um, and again, it's vertical, right? It, it, they're three-dimensional food systems. It's so important um, to understand that. So again, you know, pumpkins and leaves and greens, pumpkin leaves are food, by the way. I hope everyone knows that all of this pumpkin leaves are, are vegetable. Um, so when we talk about three sisters, people think, oh, it's only the maize, the corn they're eating. No, 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 no. That's a green nutrient, micronutrient rich, vegetables. So you've got the pumpkin as well as the leaves. All of this is food, 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 food. Um, I love this. Uh, she's, I think she's on the phone being like, you can't believe my cabbages. Um, sorry, quick break. I saw a meme on Facebook that in, uh, in, in Kiev, a woman, there was a Russian drone flying outside of her apartment and she went on the balcony and took a jar of um, pickles and threw it at the Russian drone and knocked it out of the sky. I just thought of that because I saw the um, cabbages. <laughs> so, you know, resilience is the name of the game here. Hold on. I, speaking of, I have a cat named Mushroom that's making noise over here. One second. Oh. Okay. So, uh, again, so many different types of food, different types of nutrition. And these are not only for the household, but also for market. And don't forget, this is a community that is under lockdown. They have movement restrictions. No one can go anywhere. Cargo is not coming in. So they not only have food, but they have, can have income because they're selling. And of course, they have seeds, which have already been replanted many times. So moving on to the other parts of the story. We had in our plan to also make primary swales, two large primary swales across the entirety of the mountain. So what that means is not that they're huge swales, but the special thing about them is that they are inter-farms. So you're having to like pull farmers together and say, look, dude, like this structure is going to cut across your property, my property, we have to collaborate, you know, and so there's a peace building element in there and a community building element in there. And of course, you have to design for the users of the system, whether that's a car or a camel. So footbridges or any other um, passage routes or, you know, accessibility has to be designed for realistically who are the users of that site. I'm sure you've been on college campuses says do not walk on the grass and you have these really nice rectilinear gardens and all of them have footpaths because humans like crows will take the you know straight path so design for the users of the site whether they're college students or camels so again collaboration between farmers and community for collective flood and erosion control action so here's the team we've got incentive workers we have our community members we have volunteers all working together to create, you know, not massive swales. These are these are modest little um, swales, but they cut across numerous farms. And then, of course, we have footbridges uh, that can accommodate the the motorbikes, that can accommodate the uh, livestock that are coming across, but still allow for water to spread out across the bioswale. And then, of course, um, we. We started with Evelina's farm, but then the idea was to spread out. So we had we talked about primary swales, and then 
in our team, we talked about secondary soils. The secondary soils are the ones that are on the individual farms. So here, you know, we have the primary soils, but now we're working with individual farmers to design their own farms. And you'll see that because these have all have smile berms, we are heavily emphasizing the agroforestry systems that will root and tie that soil together in place and hold it in place, right? Um, so again, looking at uh, from a smaller farm, this is, you know, I don't know if this is a, a farm or a garden, so we kind of call it a farden, but here we're designing um, around, a, this is just a small homestead, but there's water passing through, and so uh, we designed a garden here that, you know, as I mentioned, is a prison for water, right? Uh, it's a prison for water because you can see here one, two, three, four, five smile berms that spill over into this bioswale, and then here's garden beds and another bioswale and more garden beds and another swale and more smile berms. So water just is like, can't leave. It's just, it's a prison for water. It just hangs out, it arrives, and it's in a parking lot. Um, and so here's the community uh, around the beds discussing, you know, what they learned. And so now on other farms, these are now larger farms. Again, bioswales combined with uh, trellises and tree systems. And, you know, don't forget every one of these smile berms in and of itself is a garden. It's a guild. I call it, a, you know, like a one tree food forest. <laughs> um, you put pumpkins in there and greens and climbing things. And, and, you know, just it should be a little micro jungle of food. And here's another example. So that we're getting in bananas and all kinds of different other trees. So I think here they retrofitted existing bananas. So we're coming in and, and you know bringing additional support to the systems that are already there. And then of course we had this awful situation where I got a phone call that the someone in the community had totally scorched some of our work that was on the landscape level, not on individual farms, but where we had done the one rock dams and a lot of the sort of uh, supports with the existing trees, it just, and all got scorched, which is a problem because we spent so much time giving those trees a haircut so that that organic material could fall on the ground and build the forest floor. And here it has all gone up in flames. So, you know, again, these are some of the things that happen and um, you have to understand where you are and why are people doing this and the community generally was quite upset and so there had to be a certain intervention with local government and that's not my that's not my show I'm not you know they, they, they have to come together as a community and figure out like who did this do they want to have an investigation how do they want to address it but that is a locally 1000% locally driven response to an activity like this. And part of that was the police um, who, you know, we had brought uh, the team, the local team had brought them on board because this had happened, this incident. But the police chief was like, you know, he, as he's taking the report of the incident, he's like, wait a minute what you guys are doing what you know so he's a farmer the police chief and he's like I want this so he asked us to actually come and at the police station establish a demonstration site train the police officers who some of them weren't very happy about it others were but uh, you know the police chief wanted every single police officer to have their own garden bed to create kind of a competition to see you know who will have their uh have their their garden bed survive. We did trees, but this was, it turned out to be a sort of a celebratory thing. You know, we uh, engaged with the local, uh, the, the police station and community leadership and turned what was actually a really sad thing into an, a positive and demonstrative action, which was really, which was really good. So, you know, um, when I do the train uh, trainings with so, uh, some trainings with Warren Brush, who wasn't involved in this one in uh, particular in Burundi, but we always talk about the three most powerful ways for changing behavior. Number one is hands down demonstration, right? If you have a strong demonstration site, that is the best way to have people see and change their behavior. Number two is demonstration. <laughs> um, people believe what they see. And then of course, number three is demonstration. So get it done, get it off the ground, show people what's possible. And there's no other way to convince people. And with the results that they see, people do become very convinced. So um, with that, I just wanted to end by saying that by having these many small little interventions, within one year and with less than $100,000, we were able to completely stop the flooding, the flash floods and that extreme behavior on the entire mountain. So um, now the question is, you know, I'm not part of this anymore and I'm still in touch with the team that 
is on the ground, I mean, the, the local community, uh, and they are working with local government. It has spread now to the surrounding mountains. Uh, it's the top of the town. People know that something is going on there. We were really good at doing um, walking tours with the governor's office and really doing these shared learning dialogues and learning events, bringing in all different types of you know, state and or, you know, local and non-local actors, meaning like public officials and also uh, community members um, and doing walking tours, sensitizing them, having little micro learning events. Uh, and it has you know, started to spread at least to three other mountains surrounding this one. So uh, you know, now the question is, are they, will they keep, uh, upkeep it? Will they maintain it? Um, I definitely, you know, I had one year. Um, definitely, I would recommend longer you know, multi-year programming, but it doesn't cost a huge amount of money. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your time. This is a, a picture that I took of one of the kids that says, um, nothing is as it seems. So amen to that. Uh, but thank you for your time. And um, yeah, that's it. I'll hand it over to you, Javin. Natalie, thanks so much. Thank you so much for sharing the conversation, the arc, the growth. I think something that I really took away from your presentation was that as you're going through this work, as you're building, you're constantly checking and improving. And I think that one one rock dam that you were showing that, okay, yeah, we need to we need to alter this and we need to move this in the direction that is more gentle and pacifies the water. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I think those types of conversations we don't see all the time. I think a lot of folks show their work and they say it's the best work ever and it could never get any better and. For anybody who's ever put anything in the ground, you know that's not true. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't remember the last structure I put in the ground where I was like, perfect, nothing. <laughs> but there's right. always something to learn from. No learnings to be had. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> when when right. you when you look at this as a whole, uh, and and all that happened and all that's come, you started to say a little bit more about some of the things you wish you could have done differently. One of them was having longer connection with the folks, having more time to go back. What are other things that come to you in terms of things you would have changed or improved upon? Mm, territorialism, you know, like, you know, some people speak English, some people have smartphones and they tend to be knowledge hoarders. That's a human trait, I think, you know, knowledge is power. So like making sure that you can regularly um, touch base with women don't have smartphones by the way you know like it's usually the men and the men are gonna maybe do activity for their own reasons maybe for income and that's traditionally the history of agroecology right women want different period different three p's different plants and different products at different periods for different purposes and so women will grow a lot of different things around the house because babies gotta eat every day right Whereas men are like, no, we're gonna take 100% of the entire lot and just do monoculture for regional and global trade. And that is when that's really marks the masculinization of food systems from the seeds to the supply chains. And that's really when we pooped the bed as a humanity was when food systems became masculinized. Um, and so, you know, how do we how do we make sure that we continue to be inclusive, that everyone has uh, equal access to the information and the inspiration and the vision of what we're trying to do, and they have the encouragement, uh, even if it's remotely. Um, you have to engage with local government. It's such a must. And they, sometimes they change. We had an election in the middle of it. We had a new governor. We had a new people in his office. So again, we created a PowerPoint presentation for, for the new incoming um, leadership and made sure that they were aware of what we're doing. Uh, being really transparent, you know, we don't, in working in these contexts, maybe there could be some suspicions or, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I think it helped a lot that we had one third host community, one third uh, returnees and one third IDPs. So that maintained, you know, there wasn't favoritism that one group is being favored over another. Um, what else? Um, I would have, if I had more time, money and everything, uh, more support on the seeds. Pest control, pest management, how do you do problem solving? Um, and just continuous, you know, the thing is, is that with citizen engineering, you really have to, you're sharpening people's, cons I mean, uh, minds for design thinking, and that has to be constantly reinforced. Same, even in our courses with low-tech erosion control, there's no rule of, I mean, there's no like standard design. We're, we're, we're applying principles, not designs, right? So 
it's a principle based design thinking that we and making sure that everyone is sort of at the same level with understanding those principles. Um, I wish we had had more support to Evelina, you know, she was extremely acutely vulnerable and, you know, the team on the ground just for whatever re different reasons, you know, I wish that her site was as thriving as some of the other ones, um, especially because hers is such a key site on the, you know, is the topmost farmer in that system. Um, I would, well, this wasn't part of the presentation, but, you know, the more people have money, the more we have motorbikes zooming around town and people don't want to walk up the hill. They want to take a, what's called a boda, boda, boda. Um, it's a little motorbike, you know, that you can like a hired taxi. That, those motorbikes are so destructive on that soft, sandy soil that just those track lines of one motorbike, if that soil is soft, is you've already, you're creating rills. Like they're driving around imprinting rills in the landscape. So, you know, I mean, there's so many things. Um, I would have, you know, I would have, my plan was to have national level learning events. And I won't go into why that didn't happen, but we needed to have learning events and shared learning dialogues at the national level uh, around, you know, the, like I said, their, their concept of afforestation is totally the wrong thing. Eucalyptus, grevillea, and pine trees. They have no concept of, of the biology, right? They have no concept of the biology and the importance of it. Um, so I would, have, I would have had ministers and the office of the prime minister, and let's give some presentations. Let's like create dialogue and buzz and evidence base to share out. Uh, the documentation also has been really weak, you know, like, well, you know, we had a baseline and we did get data, but there has to be more follow up multi year again, right, because the thing is with a system like this. Once it's commissioned, I mean you you can dig a bunch of things, but until the first frame comes you're not going to know how the system is going to respond and it'll shift and sediment shifts and something breaks or berm was weak, so you have to have regular visits and observation and follow-up and, and repair and maintenance and management of the system. This is not a one-off thing, right? You can't just dig a thing and then see you later. No, it's a, it's a constant iterative adaptive management and adaptive learning process. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's always that question. And I think that's the balance between, you know, the, the practitioner's desire and the realities of the world. I, I think when I've been in these places where I want to see it go as big and as large as possible, there's always the realities of what's around us. I remember um, having a, 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 a stalwart chief in a neighboring village demand a bribe to mm -hmm. even proceed with work in a neighboring village and it was, it was this moment where, you know, the idealism of what you're doing comes up against the reality of the situation that in, in so many of these places, corruption and bribery and interactions at that level are so commonplace that there's no, there's no qualms about it. And so it's, it's just being realistic with our time. Do you find that that frustration in terms of, you know, wanting to get everybody in, wanting to get the bigger conversation happening, wanting to get agricultural ministers and individuals who are able to make change does does the lack of that happening on pro projects dissuade you or does that just fuel you up like does that make you more excited and more um, determined to spread the information so it depends um i would say you know permaculture's middle name is it depends um contexts are different and um, when knowledge is the main input it's really hard to ask for bribes um, because like what's a percentage of knowledge you know so um i think that to be honest like yeah we have we have corruption and people asking for bribes all the time but i think that we gain a lot of street cred and respect from local leadership because when they see this working 
they're way more interested in figuring out how, like, they're like, whoa, what, what exactly are you teaching? Can I come and be a part of this training? I want to take that knowledge and the bribe <laughs> that you get or the, the, the handout that you get, the kickback is this knowledge that will allow you to go and create your own system, which is productive and make money. And, you know, and, and to the point that it's actually been sometimes frustrating, like we do these trainings with staff and people um, and, you know, we do two weeks training sometimes like with Warren and suddenly the last day, everyone suddenly asks for leave and they'll rush home to their upcountry village. And they like, I mean, when we do the trainings, I always say we don't, I don't hold workshops. I hold work hard shops, right? People are like, well, do we have a packing list? Like, what should we bring? I'm like, bring gumboots and Panadol or aspirin, right? That's all you need. It is so intense. So people go through these incredibly intense training. Then they still somehow have the energy to run home and design their own farm. But um, in one context, um, I won't say which country it was, but I was so ticked off. Um, what I realized what was happening is that the, the, the staff who'd been trained were not actively rolling it out into the programs and integrating it into our projects. They were hoarding it because they're like, this is the holy grail. I am going to create my own farm and I am going to make a poop ton of money um, with these principles. And it didn't get passed down into the hundreds of millions of dollar projects that we have in that particular Horn of Africa country. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it is a reality, but I think that, you know, when people see the potential that I think for them, it's uh, the, the benefit that they can get is by participating and learning as much as possible. And then that other stuff that is very real, the bribes and the corruption, all that hasn't really featured. It's not the alpha thing that's going on, you know? And also people, you know, if you go to a government office and they see the, the potential of this, the, you know, that can be their legacy, right? If you're, a, if you're a governor in a desert, dry land, arid and semi-arid land county, and suddenly you've figured out that you can re-green your community and make it resilient to flood and food, and maybe be in the newspaper, and, and this can be your whole legacy attached to your identity and your political status, that is worth something, you know? Brilliant. Brilliant. I love that. Uh, I think it gives a lot of direction to folks that are doing this work, but also to folks that might want to be supporting this work. Natalie, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much for sharing this work. Thanks so much for doing this work. I think you, like I, see it as a all hands on deck situation on uh, Spaceship Earth. And I just so <laughs> appreciate you sharing your, your passion, your enthusiasm, you fire me back up, which I love. I love. I love that that interconnectivity. And uh, if people wanted to get a hold of you or find out more about your work, where would they do that? Um, well, I'm easy to find on social media. <laughs> um, so uh, LinkedIn is uh, is the best place. Uh, my email address is Natalie Topa, N A T A L I E T O P A at gmail.com. No dots or or what are those uh, things are. Um, so. I have Facebook groups. Um, I have five Facebook groups. One is called Natalie Topa Colon Permaculture and Resilience Design, which is focused a lot on the food and ecology systems. I have another group called Natalie Topa Colon Regenerative Communities and Circular Bioeconomies, which I post a lot about another passion of mine, which is how we create a, you know, a built environment with natural buildings and how is that linked to how we grow the materials in a regenerative and circular way. There's a group called Natalie Topa colon, um, the permaculture kitchen and home, cause I'm kind of chefy, I like cooking, like food and sustainable food and all that. Uh, there's one Natalie Topa colon seed saving and sovereignty because that is critical. Uh, and then the last one is Natalie Topa colon uh, fungi and mycology. I think you recall, I have a cat named mushroom. I grow mushrooms in my home. Uh, I grew up foraging for mushrooms with my Polish family. So those are the groups uh, that just send a, a request to join. Um, so I think that's it. I'm not a big tweeter or, or Instagrammer. I have the accounts, but I'm not that active there. Awesome. Uh, thanks also, Javin, because this is the first time that I have told the full story of Burundi and how we did it. Uh, so I've never gone to this level of detail on any presentation. 
And it was super helpful for me to just go back and be like, wow, there's, there's so many things that we did, right? Different types of strategies on a big mountain, just a lot of little tiny different things, which I think is what made it effective. Yeah, yeah. And and it, I think it's that level of detail. It's, it's again, that patterns to detail conversation. Let's make yeah. sure that we have the concept. And I love that you tied this into the low tech erosion control course. There's, there's, mm -hmm. there's build to fit, but there's never recipe dependent. Like mm -hmm. we, they all have to be so suited. And so it's really about becoming craftspeople who are aware of principles and practices and then suit with what we're seeing, who understand how water moves and flows to understand parent material and how it erodes to understand erosion itself, yeah. to have some level of social competency so we can uh, interact with people and share our stories. And I think you do this masterfully, speak in a way that everyone can um, grok and become sticky and has that mind, that mental Velcro that just sticks to them. And like, oh yeah, I remember that thing because it was funny and enjoyable. And I remember kind of a side story, but um, a couple of years ago, I was, I was transitioning careers way before I got into regenerative land care work. And I was helping a group of people to re to start a whole new snow sport called snow biking in Canada. It, it, it's been popularized in Austria for a long time. And I had a chance to work with one of the gentlemen who worked uh, okay. with Burton to develop snowboarding. And he had said something really fascinating that I still think to this, to this day, and you emulate really well, which is when you get a bunch of people together, first and foremost, you have to take care of the logistics. You have to make them feel comfortable. You have to let them know where the exits are, where the washrooms are, when there's right. going to be break, when they're going to be in. They have to calm their limbic system so they're not in fight, flight, or freeze. They have to be able to calm down so that way they're ready to receive information. Second, he said, it has to be fun. It has to be enjoyable. You have to be playing and be playful and be joking and use mnemonics and, you know, really enjoy the process. And I love this last bit. And he goes, then, and maybe they might learn something. And that last bit, the idea that, you know, here's somebody who helped jumpstart snowboarding that had a huge amount of resistance to it. We don't think about it today, but when it came out in the late eighties, nineties, there was so much pushback. And yet when you make it fun, when you take care of people, it just flows and you are such a master at that. So I just want to thank you for, for demonstrating that today. I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for your work and for re-inspiring me and just thank you for all that you are and all that you do. It's such a pleasure to meet somebody else who, who feels about this work in the way that I do and uh, communicates it so well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Javin. You know, Warren always says, um, put your life's energy into life affirming work, right? Um, of all the jobs we can do, is it life affirming? And for me, this is my choice of life affirming work. So thanks for the opportunity and sharing it out. Um, and yeah, I, I encourage everyone, you know, start small, start experimenting around where you are and, and that's it. I think uh, for me, there are more solutions than there are problems. And, uh, you know, we are, we are transitioning to an ecological civilization and that is, that's good news. Little by little, we may not make it in time, but we got to die trying. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. thanks so much, Javin. Uh, you're most welcome, Natalie. For everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Uh, if this was enjoyable, feel free to hit the like and subscribe button, not to mention the bell, as well as if you're looking for more of this type of education or this specific tool set, there's a pre-existing course on regenerative living dot online called Low Tech Erosion Control. And Natalie are, and I are in talks about potentially offering something in the future. Thanks so much, everybody. And we'll see you in the next video. Take care.